Good morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you may be viewing this World Stem Cell Summit 2022 session. For the next 65 minutes, my colleagues and I will be focused on our need as a global species to begin the race with purposeful pace beyond time and space to continue the process of evolution that began most likely long ago and very far away. Please allow me to introduce myself and my colleagues. I am Alan Giacomo, a biotech infotech transactions lawyer now business development advisor and wannabe deep learning mathematician. I've been working with Bernie Siegel on World Stem Cell Summits since 2007, the year that the labs run by doctors Yamanaka and Thompson each reported the induction of pluripotent stem cells from adult human fibroblasts by defined transcription factors, and also the year that the U.S. National Aeronautics and Space Administration sent three space transportation system missions, each abbreviated as STS, followed by its identifying number, to the International Space Station, abbreviated as ISS. 2007 marked the midpoint between the re-entry breakup of the Columbia Orbiter in 2003 and the retirement in 2011 of the fleet of three remaining shuttles. I am joined today by Dr. Graham Parker, a faculty member in the Department of Pediatrics at Wayne State University in Detroit where he co-leads an NIH Integrative Health Sciences Facility Corps. He also, quite importantly for today's session, is the editor-in-chief of the journal Stem Cells and Development and is executive director of the journal Nucleic Acid Therapeutics. Graham will lead off today's session with an exposition of why we need to begin the race to outer space. My next colleague is Dr. Gene Loring whose accomplishments in the field of stem cell-based regenerative medicine are very wide and very deep. For many years, she directed the Center for Regenerative Medicine at Scripps and La Jolla. She will follow Graham with tantalizing descriptions of three subjects. First, the series of iPSC-derived neural organoid experiments on the International Space Station for which she is the principal investigator. Second, her role in the seminal IPSC-based project at the San Diego Zoo's Conservation, Conservation Research Center to repopulate the world's population of northern white rhinoceri, an endangered species. And third, how those first two projects come together for purposes of our space-time bound race. In the third part of her riff, she'll comment on the role of artificial intelligence in her work. The third of my colleagues is Beth Roxland, who by combining her formal training in law and bioethics, serves as a strategic advisor on matters of law, policy, and ethics in the fields of stem cell research, regenerative medicine, gene therapies, clinical trials and drug development, and the growing field of AI ethics. If we had more time, we would spend a whole lot of it focused on the need for diversity-oriented policies in the field of AI ethics, a subject on which Beth focuses. Beth will focus us on the ethical challenges posed by our space-time race. So without further delay, let me turn to Graham. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, what we're talking about today is what is, in my view, the inevitable human outreach into space. 
we know even even if you were to say no 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 we have to look after our own planet the chances that something flying around in space is going to hit the earth is is just it's just too high it's going to it's going to happen and uh regardless of the uh personal uh aspirations of certain uh, very wealthy people in order to move into space we know that humanity is going to want to make that move but there there are certain issues about those efforts that i think our audience will be interested in getting a better understanding of uh, some of the perils that are involved in achieving this off-world colonization. Uh, some very, very basic uh, concepts about the Earth and uh, our other planets in the solar system have to be understood. We're, we're fairly unique. We have a what we call a magnetosphere, and the magnetosphere uh, for Earth is based on uh, our own core. The core of our planet uh, produces a magnetic field. And this is very, very important for our survival and the survival of the Earth. Uh, when you look up, when you're traveling the world and you enjoy the uh, Aurora Borealis, what you're actually looking at is fairly terrifying. What you're looking at there is the million mile per hour solar wind ripping at the Earth's atmosphere. And the reason that it doesn't burn off our ozone layer, burn off our protection to leave us uh, stranded and exposed to the radiation of space is because of that magnetosphere, which is intact. Um, many of you probably don't actually know that um, Mars at one point had water. Mars had an atmosphere. It was burned away by the solar winds that I'm talking about. So understanding just how unaccommodating the rest of the universe is compared to the Earth is a very, very important subject that we should be discussing. Uh, and when I say the solar wind, it's not just the solar wind that it's protecting us from. It's, it's, it's protecting us for some pretty amazing cosmic rays from deep space as well. So that's the radiation part of it. But the other thing we've got to be thinking about is gravity, the gravity of our situation. Uh, gravity has literally shaped the evolution <laughs> of life on Earth. And we have to understand how that has influenced the evolution of us as species, but then ontogenetically, as individual development, that gravity impacts gene expression, it impacts morphogenesis, what I mean by that is the development of the body during early development, and then as we develop as a human being, the mechanical loading associated with that gravity increases cell proliferation and differentiation. And the influence that those physical forces have on our cells and converts into cellular response, that's called mechanotransduction, to give the technical term, only exerts a greater influence as we become a more cellular committed individual. And do we understand exactly how that works? No, we don't. So when we start to ask questions about what happens when we lead, leave planet Earth and attempt to develop as individual <laughs> members of the human race in a low gravity environment? If we don't have a guidebook before then that allows us to understand how that development actually occurs, we're going to have a really, really hard time to mitigate whatever effects that lack of gravity has on our development. And that's going to involve a lot of techniques with omic at the end of it, which I'm not going to bore the audience uh, to understand everything about, but just that they, they should understand that the actual staging of the embryo and the lineage determination absolutely depends on us understanding how that normally occurs so that we can understand what happens when it's not exposed to the forces that it usually is. Now, going back to that terrifying introduction about the radiation, because 
really, when we talk about environmental stresses of space, we're really talking about gravity and various forms of radiation. And it's not just one form of radiation. There's lots of different forms of radiation in space. And we should be worried about all of them. And they should all probably have very different effects on different systems, whether we're talking about our hematopoietic stem cells, that's our blood supply, whether we're talking about the uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Usually when people are talking about research and thinking about going into space, they're thinking about muscles, they're thinking about tissue wasting, they're thinking about bone structure. But those mesenchymal stem cells also serve as the microenvironment for how our blood supply is produced. And guess what? Those two different cell populations react very, very differently to uh, solar and galactic cosmic radiation. And that was shown by a very, very elegant study by Grasa Almeida Parada from Wake Forest. And uh, what they basically showed was that you could uh, look at the effects of, of such exposures on hematopoietic stem cells, but you could then also take stem cells that haven't been exposed to that and put them in a microenvironment that had been exposed to that radiation. And then you also have very deleterious effects from radiation. But we're not mice, we're humans. Do all animals respond in the same way to the effects of radiation or the effects of different levels of gravity? No, they most certainly do not. Dan Rapley at Wayne State University has done studies comparing cows and mice to understand what the effect of radiation are there. And they respond very, very differently. Uh, bovine and murine, cow and mouse oocytes, uh, die when exposed to radiation, but their response is a very different one. The, the, the mice oocytes die by necrosis, whereas the bovine oocytes seem to have some level of ability to respond and repair the damage to their DNA, but they definitely don't like it. But that then holds out to us the hope that maybe as humans, maybe ours are even better at responding to uh, the exposures. Obviously, this is all in the future. We have no idea. Nobody's, nobody's, uh, uh, nobody's been able to do an experiment to actually find out the answer. But people have already been doing these kind of tests and experiments on birds, sea urchins, amphibians, fish. And so far, so far, the answer is inconclusive. We don't know the answer. One of the things that also from a development point of view, which is a much easier experiment to do, was done by Wakayama. And they took um, the sperm of mice that had been on the International Space Station for nine months and demonstrated that although they could produce viable offspring, uh, there was some damage done. What they actually thought was that the, uh, the mouse oocyte was able to repair the damage that occurred to the mouse sperm, which I think is very interesting. Less, less encouraging, I'm sorry, this is a very grumpy exposition, uh, was uh, some mouse embryos that were carried on the Columbia STS-80. And of the 59 two-cell stage mouse embryos that were on board, none of them developed beyond the two-cell stage, whereas 20% of control embryos did. So there's definitely reason to believe that there are issues that need to be addressed, that need to be understood before we can successfully uh, populate in science. Um, so what we have to understand as well, and, and I know that my colleagues do understand this, is that those data that have so far been uh, accumulated, most of it are on earthbound investigations, but some of them, actually do involve space exploration of stem cell experiments. And Jean Loring is going to tell us much more than I can tell you about her personal experience of doing stem cell research in space. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm happy to. Thank you, Alan. Um, so the, this is not very long history. Um, obviously, the NASA program or NASA in general, all of the space programs, and it goes way beyond NASA now, as I'm sure everybody is aware, um, is, um, is not, not very deep in stem cells because the stem cell technology was not up 
to the um, the challenge of uh, doing reasonable experiments in microgravity, which is what we're really interested in. So oh, that only goes a few years back. And uh, so what my own experience has been for um, rocket launches, or actually this will be our fourth uh, next month. And the idea behind studying stem cells in space, I think is, was really rooted in, um, in curiosity um, along with a sort of interesting commercial spin on it because NASA of course wants to be able to commercialize their uh, technology, their space technology. So we were asking, or they were asking, and we were trying to answer questions like, um, is there something we can do better in space than we can do on the ground? Is there something we can discover in space that we can't discover on the ground? And to all, to be able to ask those questions, you really need a, uh, in, in our case, a, in the case of my area of expertise is a, is a technology, is a core technology. So when we were designing our first, um, we had the opportunity to send stem cell, uh, pluripotent stem cells, and, and in fact, induced pluripotent stem cells, which um, I think everybody knows now are cells that have the same genome as the person from which those cells were taken. So the, the idea was, uh, was to try to figure out if there was something that could be done with stem cells in space that could not be, or in microgravity, which is not the same as space, but microgravity, just a little bit of gravity left, um, that couldn't be done in, on, on the earth, something novel. And I, I think there were two aspects of this that were particularly interesting. One of them is the history of how space travel has improved technology, everything from computing to the actual, the instrumentation and the, um, the ability to assess things in, um, and, and, in a, in a sort of tight environment. So everything has to be designed so that it will fit and it fit into a very small space because space is a premium. Sorry to have to use that word. Space is at a premium in space. And the, uh, and the experiments have to be designed so that you can get an answer that is relevant um, in a relatively short period of time because the the time of a flight on the ISS, unless it's a human astronaut, is usually about 30 days. That was, that was the, what we were aiming for. So the, uh, what we found, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut right to the chase because I'm, I wanna think about the future as well. We have been studying neurodegenerative disease, which is one of my really great interests, and specifically multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. So we designed an experiment in which we could uh, make organoids out of, out of uh, neurons of specific people uh, who either had MS or Parkinson's disease. And these are very tiny brain-like structures. We don't call them brains, we call them neural organoids because they don't, they, they're just a very small representation of a part of the brain. The two parts of the brain we decided to study were the cortex where most of the MS uh, lesions are and the, um, the midbrain, which is where the dopamine neurons are that die in Parkinson's disease. And we were interested, we, were, we hypothesized, although when you're gonna do something, you know, send something up into space, a hypothesis is kind of, um, kind of silly because we have no idea what's gonna happen, um, including we didn't even know they'd survive uh, in space in that context. I mean, we know people can, but can organoids. So the good news was that the organoids do survive in space and that they, they're very, very small. They're maybe 200 to 500 microns across. Um, they're, they're spheroid. And we put them in a small amount of culture medium and did a static culture for 30 days and brought them back down. Um, it was quite a, quite a journey. So you think about the rocket going up, but there's a lot that goes on before that, especially if you're designing an experiment. Um, you have to anticipate all the challenges that you will have. You have to have the right equipment. You have to have the right idea. It has to be simple because this is, uh, we're not gonna learn, we're gonna learn some really fundamental things. We have to start with that. So the idea behind uh, looking at stem cells, I think uh, in my mind at least, is to try to find out what might be going on um, in astronauts' bodies that we don't know about. Um, and we, definitely do not know the, uh, very much about the effect 
on uh, on on microgravity for long periods of time on people's like probability to get multiple sclerosis or people's probability to get Parkinson's disease. And uh, so the, the idea was to try to find out whether there was an effect of microgravity on perhaps some kind of a, uh, of a uh, neurodegenerative process. So what we found out was a lot subtler than that. Um, the, the neurons all survived. They survived beautifully. They grew wonderfully when we brought them back from space and put them into culture dishes. They, they were really healthy. In fact, they were more, they seemed to be more vigorous than the ones that we had, the parallel studies that we'd had kept on earth. So I don't know the, why that is yet. Um, this is gonna take, I think, a little bit of physics as well as biology to really understand the effects of not having any gravity on uh, adult structures. Um, and we found that they seem to show signs of, of a kind of stress that isn't generally um, associated with the brain. It's more of like a, um, of a, a DNA stress, although they, aren't they are not subjected to any more radiation. We have radiation monitors. So it's not caused by radiation, it's caused by microgravity. So let's go forward. And if uh, I think what we're, what we're considering, um, and, and the sky's the limit, honestly, you can think about all sorts of things, especially when people are talking about going to Mars. Um, we'll be, be doing um, in vitro fertilization in space. Will we be doing, um, will we need to monitor uh, different aspects of an astronaut's body in, uh, in a culture system over time and space? And I think when you think about human development, that's one thing that hasn't happened. People have been in, in space, but no baby has been conceived in space and no baby has been born in space. And we don't know what, what microgravity effects will have on embryonic development. That's one of the questions that we can address with stem cells. Um, and we're just starting. I mean, I, this, the, I'm hoping that we get something very clear in the next five years or so, if you look down the road a bit, some real clear answer that's not simplistic, but um, is, will tell us uh, something, in, it will, will change our intuition about what happens in microgravity or what happens when you don't have, when you don't have gravity. Um, and I, I think we can probably achieve that. The, th the thing is when you're doing experiments in a lab, you can repeat them like every week or you can, you can have them overlap and just start, start another experiment a week after the first one. When you're sending cells into space, there's such, such an elaborate um, uh, preparation to get the cells to the space station in the first place that you really uh, have to, you can't repeat your experiment right away. It's a year before you can repeat your experiment. This is more like, this is like a throwback to um, the old days when we were just observing things in, uh, in nature, in biology, rather than, um, than experimenting with them. Um, we're observing what happens now. And we, uh, as I said, I hope we have insights and in, that will tell us about what we can expect to have happen to people. And we, there are a lot of subtle effects on astronauts that we don't really know about yet. We don't really understand because this has not been going on for very long. And um, as, we, as you know, I'm sure from recent, uh, a lot of recent studies have, have talked about triggers for disease and how you could be infected with a virus and that increases your chances of getting multiple sclerosis, for example. And that could happen long before it, it actually, uh, the, the pathology arises. So is microgravity and, uh, and long-term space flight, whatever else that can, entails, the stress of being up there in a capsule um, in a small space, is that going to um, have long-term effects on, on people? We don't know yet because they haven't lived long enough to be able to see whether there's a higher instance of anything. So uh, I, this is an information gathering uh, period. But I did want to mention one thing, and that is when I watched the, um, the Falcon rocket send up the Dragon capsule with ourselves, our experiments on, on it um, from Cape Canaveral, I thought there is so much that could go wrong trying to put a rocket and have it actually attached to the International Space Station. And all of that has nothing to do with biology. And so biology is um, a lot more complicated than that. 
it just struck me as if we could do, if we can do this, if the, you know, the mind of man and woman can design a system that will shoot off into space, that can carry people um, and, and not damage them, can carry all sorts of things and not damage them and have them very precisely uh, end up in the right place and then come back down again, then we really should be able to do the same thing with biology and we should be able to, uh, it should be easy to cure a disease. Um, it can't be harder than that. So I think I'll end there and ask if you have any questions. Um, yeah. So much of the IPSC technology that you were just talking about in terms of going into space is, is really technology that you've been pioneering for so long and in particular over the last oh, 12 years or so, uh, the efforts that you've pioneered to apply IPSC technology to saving species on, on Earth that are close to extinction or just on the other side of extinction. Of course, the, and I always uh, mess up whether it's the white or the, or the black or the northern or the southern, <laughs> but I think I've got it right. It's the northern white rhinoceros that, That's right. that this technology has saved. And um, the same kind of description that you just went through with respect to, to space, sending IPSCs into space, if you could uh, talk about that in the, in the context of, of saving species, mm -hmm. that would be great. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, it all comes back down to stem cells and what can you do with them? I think that's the question that uh, we all should be thinking about. And I, I'm delighted to always talk about that with people. Um, in this case, what we're interested in, this is a collaboration with, uh, uh, with Oliver Ryder and Marisa Carodi at the San Diego Wild Animal Park. That's, I'm still going to call it that. It's the, it's the really beautiful zoo that's north of San, San Diego where the animals have lots of room. Uh, there's an Institute for Conservation Biology there. It has been going on for about, um, I think it was founded maybe in the 70s. And at the same time that this started a uh, real, real science at a zoo, um, there was a, uh, the creation of what is called the frozen zoo. It was an attempt to it, keeping in mind that animals are becoming extinct. People wanted to save some part of them for some future use. And um, the idea, I mean, it was really pretty remarkable in the seventies the material that was saved from animals that died or animals that had been collected in the wild was skin fibroblasts. And those were grown in culture and they cryopreserved in liquid nitrogen. That was a technology that was very well established in the 70s. We haven't changed it a lot since then. But what that meant was that samples of animals that were, were dead, we'd have living cells of once we thawed those cells out. So uh, we focused on the northern white rhino. There are 12 individuals that are in the frozen zoo, but there are only two animals that are still alive. And they're both female and they can't reproduce. So they're, um, so the animal, so it is, this is why we're calling this pre-extinction because animals aren't quite gone yet. And they're, they're not gonna be gone as long as their cells are in that liquid nitrogen, um, the freezer. It's like, um, it's cryopreservation. And the, I mean, one of the best uses for cryopreservation, I can imagine. You capture things and keep them frozen so they're alive. And then at some later day, some later time, maybe as much as like 30 or 40 years later, somebody comes along with a method that will turn fibroblasts into pluripotent stem cells, which is what happened uh, when Shinya Yamanaka invented IPS technology, reprogramming of cells reported it for humans in 2007. That's when we started thinking about using that technology for other, um, other animals besides humans. And the Northern White Rhino has worked very well. We just published a paper last year on making IPF cells from nine different individuals of the Northern White Rhino species. Uh, that's nine out of the 12 that have been frozen and there are only two alive. So most of those animals are already dead, but we have IPS cells, which can differentiate into every cell type. Um, it's quite remarkable. It struck me because one of the cell types they can make are heart cells and heart cells beat in culture. 
and it almost seems like they've been um, reborn when you see those cells in a culture dish from an animal that's dead. It's been dead for 10 years or 20 years. Um, and they're beating in a culture dish. They're clearly alive. So the, the ultimate goal is to make um, what are called artificial gametes from those iPS cells. It's a technology that was developed in the mouse, like most of these technologies for stem cells are first done in the mouse. And is also being tested in humans now by, um, by several organizations, including a company that wants to help with um, assisted reproduction, people who can't have children, that you could make, uh, for example, out of iPS cells, you could make eggs, you could make oocytes, and you could fertilize those with sperm made of somebody else's iPS cells. Um, it's not gonna be trivial to do this, and it is, a, it's actually going to be easier to do in humans than it is in rhinos. Um, rhinos have, I think, about an 18 month gestation period, 15 to 18 months, something like that. And they're also, are, are, nobody's really routinely done in vitro fertilization for rhinos. So a lot of the work to save a rhino is actually, is a lot, a lot harder than I think it would be to um, assist in human reproduction. But our intention is to make um, gametes and then make embryos. And then now we're back to talking about embryos and how that, that uh, overlaps with the interest in embryos in space. So in a way it's kind of, uh, it's, it's justified to put all this effort into saving a, um, an endangered species to try to come up with new technologies for making gametes, for making um, oocytes. Because the goal is not just some trivial um, intellectual pursuit, but to actually um, rescue that animal so you can make that animal again. And it's not a clone. It'll be a, a new version of that species from two different individuals, just like normal birth. So that's what we've been working on at the, uh, with the San Diego Zoo for some time now. And we just this year uh, published the, the first um, annotated genome of the northern white rhino. And that may not, they may seem like two different things, but in fact, there's very little you can do with genomics or epigenetics with any iPS cells, unless you have the genome of that species in order to create all the tools that you need for doing that. So now we have both of those things. And um, of course, the first thing we're moving forward with, or, or they are moving forward with, I'm an advisor. I don't put my hands on the cultures in the lab, um, but I. But what we're trying to do is to make uh, primordial germ cells, which are the precursors to sperm and eggs. And in order to do that, you need to know what genes are expressed, very much like when you're reprogramming cells, knowing which genes are expressed, which transcription factors are, are expressed, allow you to actually change the fate of cells. So finding that out for the rhino and using it to make primordial germ, using that information to make primordial, primordial germ cells will require both the iPS cells and the whole genome sequence of the northern white rhino. So all these things are based in stem cells and they're all things that I'm hoping to see come to some kind of, of good end in the uh, future. And I've said um, many times that I would like very much to see a a northern white rhino calf born um, in my lifetime. That would be, I think that's a, a reasonable, if, if not impossible goal. <laughs> um, yeah, the first time I saw a northern white rhino was just, I was just thought, that's a magnificent animal. And, and you know, how, what goes into creating it? it? I mean, what goes into the embryology of this animal? What goes into getting it to this stage and, and, how on earth can we possibly figure out how to generate one? And now that's happening. And I think you're saying in parallel, seeing the, the rocket launch, it's just like, I, if we can do that, we should be able to figure out how to do this, right? Um, because we just, we have so much capacity for imagination and, and, and hope that, and then if you add stem cells, you've got a really great combination. In, in terms of bringing those two fields together. Yeah, I think, I think all these experiences uh, feed on each other. Um, 
and you know, and I have an, I have, I have some other projects that I'm doing as well to to um, try to treat Parkinson's disease with stem with uh, neurons derived from stem cells. It it all um, it all feeds into the same into the same uh, sort of grander concept that um, embryology is really important and we don't know nearly enough about it. And I think when you, you, if you thought in purely practical terms, what we learned from the Northern white rhino about its embryonic development and, its, um, and, and making uh, germ cells, if you look really far in the future, those are the kinds of cells that might go up cryopreserved in space to launch another population. Um, you can imagine we go off to planet X. We're gonna get into science fiction real quick here, Alan. We go off to planet X and we have on board uh, frozen uh, cryopreserved sperm and eggs that have been made from multiple individuals, but they're all in these little tubes. And they didn't actually come from them, they came from their iPS cells and, and the iPS cells themselves. So you have a you have a uh, a workshop there. You have a lot of of uh, things that you can do once you have those things, and they take up very little room. I like to think of the experiments that were done on the International Space Station were initially done with mice, and mice take up a lot of room. You have to feed them. Stem cells don't take up very much room at all. I mean, you could put our entire exper experiment into the body size of a mouse, you know, one mouse. So this is a very efficient way to um, monitor things over time. Again, I'm going back to that. Let's find out what happens to a particular person's brain while they're in space and use the, uh, the stem cell organoids as an avatar to monitor what might be going on and what, how we might want to treat something that we can't actually detect. Um, maybe it would be good to have um, cardiac precursors, precursors for kidney cells, precursors for liver. And that way you could sort of do the kinds of, of um, replacement surgeries or replacement therapies that you really couldn't do on somebody who's on a spaceship ordinarily. I mean, you, you need, you'd use their own tissue to regenerate their own organs. That that is I really far off in the in the future, but I think um, you know it's uh, it's not impossible. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I like the term avatar. I don't I haven't ever used it before, honestly. Um, I saw the movie, but I like the I like the term avatar because it really is like a a, a small version of me um, in that little tube that's going up into space, you know, that sort of thing. And and maybe it won't, uh, maybe a certain, maybe all people will end up the same, maybe exactly the same thing will happen to them. But that has not proved to be true, even for organoids from different people, they will be different. And that difference should feed back on the individual personalized treatment of that person. Mm -hmm. What is all of this, what, where, where does all of the biology that you've been talking about uh, today intersect with, and I'm going to use the term one more time, artificial intelligence. And of course, yeah. I, I, you know, that means a whole lot, but I'll use it as sort of an umbrella term. Where? Yeah, so um, artificial intelligence is really good for noticing things that humans don't notice. It notices patterns. It recognizes patterns that, because there's no bias. I mean, that's the real beauty of it. It's unbiased. It looks at data and says, yeah, these two things are like, and these aren't. And you would be able to tell that by looking at that. So artificial intelligence is really important for, again, in, in situations where there's no human um, interface, there's no direct human interface. Um, artificial intelligence is being used now to figure out how to culture iPS cells. I mean, the really fundamental things like, what are you seeing about this culture that tells you that it's a good one or a bad one or you need to do something with it or you don't need to do anything with it or it's gonna become something different than what you wanted. All of that is information that can be tracked and traced and assigned to that particular sample. And then if you put in all the genomic information as well and 
so you start getting physiology and genomics and cell cell interactions, um, morphogens, all that sort of thing all together. Now, I don't think you can, I, I'm not thinking you can reconstruct a human brain with a computer, but I am thinking that you can understand it simplifies things. Artificial intelligence is, it simplifies things so that we can grasp them. Otherwise it's not, it's not useful, right? If it's, if it goes off into, um, into the, into the ether and only the AI system knows what it means, so that's not very much use for us. Uh, but it does actually help us focus on the things that are important. And it, it's, a, it's already had a big impact on me because even the simplest forms of, of um, AI, like machine learning has told me like what, what uh, is the phenotype of a cell in a culture dish? What kind of cell is it? What will it do? What has it, what's its history? Yeah, you know, yeah, I can, yeah, I can sure. learn that with that. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, this reminds me that 10 to 15 years ago, you were developing that kind of technology in your lab. I, I think it's still being uh, commercialized still, today. I think it's still, it's still, still being, being used, licensed yeah. today. So. And, and, you know, so I, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of things. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with my, it, maybe it's maybe it's the same thing. Maybe I'm interested in a lot of things. Therefore, I work on stem cells, right. one or the other. In, in, Jean, in, you know, in your so, in your presentation, one of the things that you spoke about was, and this was the intersection, of course, with the work that you've done in the uh, northern white rhinoceros. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that you had mentioned was the idea that you would you would be sending gametes derived mm -hmm. from iPSC cells. And one of the questions that that posed for me and for you, rather than sending gametes, you could send uh, uh, cryopreserved embryos. No, I don't. I don't see any reason why one and not the other. Um, honestly, cryopreserved embryos are a great source of you know, humans. Um, on Earth, so why not in space? I think what we're looking for is something that's more long term. Um, if you aren't, I mean, by sending uh, stem cells, iPS cells, pluripotent stem cells, you have the the possibility of making gametes. Um, you can use gametes that are derived from those. I mean, there are lots of things you can set up. You can set up frozen cryopreserved sperm and cryopreserved oocytes because that technology has been developed on Earth, and you could send up cryopreserved embryos. So, um, uh, so with that said, with that said, and, and Beth, question to you is, from your standpoint as a bioethicist, does it matter to you whether it's frozen gametes or, or frozen embryos? Does that matter to you from a bioethical standpoint? They're both cryopreserved? Yes. I, I mean, well, it, or cryoprotected, we should say. Cryoprotected, that's probably a better um, term. Uh, on, on first blush alone, it would seem to me the what it is going to be used, how it's going to be used, how it's going to be treated would be the more germane question than whether it is cryopreserved. Um, Embryo organic. So exactly. Okay. Um, uh, embryo may, uh, for, for a lot of the population, I suppose, embryo would be more sensitive. That's, I guess that's not fully true. Um, but the, um, the cryopreservation versus something else, a, a lot of times it's, I think, more about what is going to be done with whatever the, whatever the t tissue cells, whatever, whatever they are. Um, certainly embryos are, are, you know, much more of a hot button um, for, for many. Um, but again, I think the question would be more, what is going to be done with them? Because if, if the idea with the gametes is to put them together and make embryos, um, then, then we might be talking about something very similar. And not that I have necessarily, I'm not voicing an objection one way or the other. I'm sort of just enunciating exactly, you know, I'm answering a question about sort of the sensitivities at large, I guess. Yeah, and it is very, especially sensitive where I am right now in Germany. 
um, embryo, the Embryo Protection Act is still in place and, um, and it's, it's quite different from anything else I've encountered, but it does preclude a, a lot of things that um, are okay in the rest of the world. So we do have to be sensitive to the difference in, in um, ideas and ethical principles, I yeah. guess, um, in Certainly. different countries. Gene, I think I think that's a really important point you've just raised. You know, I, I, I in almost a jocular way, but a, but a serious way as well. I, you know, we need just like Einstein had a tensor in general relativity to go from Euclidean to non-Euclidean and back again. You know, I think we're going to need sort of the same kind of mechanism to go from Earth-bound bioethics to space-bound mm -hmm. bioethics and back to an mm -hmm. exoplanet bioethics. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint. Uh, the, that was actually one of the questions that I was hoping Beth and I would, would address is that notion of uh, choice of, you know, lawyers and contracts like to call that choice of law and venue questions. So <laughs> from, a, from a bioethical standpoint, I, you know, how do, we, how do we program for that? Beth, any thoughts on that? Um. I mean, actually, one of the one of the major questions I had written down was it was almost precisely that is sort of who decides and under what rules um, and using what standards. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't. I have uh, as as any good bioethicist, I have more questions than I have answers. Um, uh, to me, a lot of the the very very substantive questions, like the minute substantive questions, are. Uh, sort of pale in comparison to the larger picture of the who decides and how do we decide and how do we figure out how to set any kind of rules or oversight or if there should be oversight or transparency or reporting more so than um, at least at the outset than getting down to the nitty gritty of the very, very specific rules. You know, if we have a, a, a set of protocols or research proposals in front of us, perhaps that's easier. And, and maybe Gene does have exactly that. And then that would be um, perhaps also a, a bit easier to address than sort of a whole body of bioethics and space. Um, but to me, the bigger issues have to do with the, the, the process and the you know the the jurisdiction and the setting of standards and by whom, if any, um, uh, and the enforcement, let's say, um, uh, but the process almost more so at first, and then as well as the substance. That process, who gets a seat at the table for for that for determining that process? Um, it. <laughs> As a bioethicist, what table? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. table? <laughs> um, I mean, look. A lot of times when we when we fund research, a lot of the uh, as everyone here knows, a lot of the rules related to the the research itself is 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 dictated by the funder. Um, and so, and I don't know that that would necessarily be the case here, um, or that it necessarily should be the case here. But uh, uh, it, this is such a vast. Uh, area that it's 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 a bit hard to uh, pin down. Graham, one of the things that struck me in in your opening remarks was all of those studies that you had cited, and I I had this uh, Im image of you in your in your position as a journal editor getting these papers from time to time that, that are in the bioaeronautics uh, arena. And my question to you is a little bit like my question to, to Beth, which is, you know, the process and timing and standards and stakeholders. Uh, for purposes of, of reviewing those papers, is, is, are there principles that need to be developed for, for bioaeronautic uh, journal review or, or is it the same old, I shouldn't say same old, or is it the existing uh, regime that you currently use for, for, for you know, editing submissions to journal articles on, on, on this subject? 
Well, as you know, we there are certain codes of ethics to do with scientific publication that we expect all of our authors to adhere to. We, if, if it involves human subjects, we expect them to have IRB approval to have done the work that they did. If it involves animals, we expect them to have AICUC approval of from the institution. And having said that, an institution might grant an approval that another institution, even within the same country, might not have approved. And Jean has already uh, referred to um, something that's, that really has influenced the, the world of pluripotent stem cell research, which is the, 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 um, the position that Germany decided to take uh, that basically meant a lot of scientists had to remove themselves from a, a, a very large field of research or move country. But even when they moved country, if they were collaborating with somebody within Germany, the work is not allowed. It's, it's a very, very complicated piece of legislation that the Germans have in place. And for us as journal editors to make a determination that a piece of work is going to be admissible, we, we, it really shouldn't matter whether it's a, a piece of work that's going into space or a piece of work that's happening on Earth, the same ethical standards should apply to determining whether the work should be approved. One thing I will comment about is, and Gene will back me on this 100%, space data are gold. For somebody to have actually managed to get an experiment off the planet Earth and whatever the data they produce. I remember I had uh, uh, a Russian set of authors who were very, very nervous about whether they could publish their work because they, uh, and again, Gene will, <laughs> Gene will, will uh, echo this, because they'd only done the experiment once. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the standards that you apply for someone that's doing work in space are different from the standards that you'd apply for someone who's doing a bench experiment that they can sit there and within three months they can do it nine times over and produce a massive N of data. Uh, I think that um, aspect of um, the rigor that's required for publication uh, can be less than useful if the same standard is applied and you say, no, you can't publish you've got to wait another two years before the next ship goes up before you can produce an N. Because even then, <laughs> you wait two years, the other ship goes up. A reviewer might well say, no, I still don't think this is, this is a large enough N. I don't think that this, this uh, satisfies my, my, my scientific uh, criteria for publication. But here's, here's the problem that we have, Alan, is because I'm talking about institutional approval for work that's being done which institution is going to grant that this approval is, we, we are at the moment in the wild wild west of space investigation we've never had uh, in my time in my lifetime a more perilous lack of communication between the people that actually have the toys that could be doing the science in space that's what we should be worrying about mm. is that if these people aren't communicating with each other what they believe mm. are the ethical standards that should be applied, then it is going to be left. An actor gets sent into space. What criteria were met before this human being was allowed to get on a space yeah. and go into space? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, an, go just ahead. An, an actor or an actor who was uh, part of research. I'm talking about an actor who played a space captain, <laughs> yeah. a real actor. <laughs> and let, let, less concerned about the the non research and uh, people than the research people. Yeah, but no, but Beth, I think no, Graham, it's relevant. Graham, 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 oh, it Graham, is relevant Graham, though. Yeah. Yes, I'm talking about see, I'm talking about standards being set for them. But yes, no, certainly it's relevant. Yeah, Graham, I think, and, and Beth, something that Graham just said animated you for a second. So I think you may have an, a further comment to what you were saying before. So let's make sure that you come back to that. But I think the the point that that Graham was making 
is uh, that uh, we need to be careful with sending icons, and I'm going to use that word for, for Captain Kirk. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, we have to be careful how how uh, uh, personalities like that, how pop culture personalities like that, uh, are used in, in this context or employed, exploited, whatever word you want to use. I think that's the point that Graham's making. That that. Uh, that kind of use of, of popular culture for something this important uh, really needs to be thought about very carefully. I think that's the point Graham is making. Graham, don't let me put words in your mouth. No, no, and that's absolutely fine. But it's just one of the points that applies to the point that I'm making, which is that someone who is ostensibly a vulnerable individual has been offered a chance to do something that perhaps they shouldn't have been allowed to do. And who is responsible for that? What if something had happened to him? What if, for some reason, when a 90-year-old man goes into orbit and is still within the protection of the magnetosphere, the 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 scale... You're talking about John Glenn, and you're talking about John Glenn now, I think. No, Kirk's 90. Oh, oh Kirk, you're still talking about <laughs> Captain Kirk. Yeah. Okay. All right. You're still talking these, about these Captain people Kirk. have okay. a vulnerability. These people have a vulnerability. Something could have happened. Some some it, some switch gets thrown in uh, by the exposure that, that that he was under. That he suffers some sort of physical harm because he's gone on a space flight. Who's responsible for that? Yeah. Who, who who actually then has to you know pay Kirk's health bills for what's occurred? Gene, I think you're on mute now. No wonder you weren't listening to me. Um, I think the, well, you know, if you go skiing, you have to, you know, you have to sign, you have to sign away, you have to say you understand that there's Informed risk. Consent. So, Informed consent. Yeah. So yeah. how, you know, how is this different? So, okay. Who did you give that informed consent to? A uh, ski resort. A ski resort. You right. <laughs> a responsible institution that we have mm -hmm. agreed as a society is able to receive an informed consent. Is that what we're dealing with in this situation? I don't think. I'm sure it was. I don't think so. It was. It was and I, I definitely I appreciate Graham's point. I do see it as different um, when we're dealing, let's say, with an actor. First of all, I don't necessarily consider them a vulnerable population um, because they have the money and want to go go for it. Um, I see it actually almost it's something more between. Uh, our, our differences between, you know, research and medicine or even medical tourism or just opportunity, um, should they uh, have a proper information transparency? Should they understand how much we don't know? Um, ostensibly, yes. Is that part of the research enterprise in my mind? I'm not sure. Um, I, I've it's not that I have no concern there. I would have more concern, though, when we're dealing with straight research um, and, and yeah. those types of um, and those types of questions. Yeah, um, I I was going to mention that I signed one of those. Uh, absolutely, will not blame you when I went on the the zip line in Hawaii just a, a few months ago. I mean, all kinds of terrible things could have happened. <laughs> you could crash into a tree. People die zip lining, right? Uh, but no, you do it. You do it because it's like I want to have some fun, and you know. So I, you know, I think you, you will sign away all of your um, your 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 rights to to uh, sue them. Of course, you won't actually do that, but you will say that I understand this is really really dangerous, and five people a year get killed doing this, and I might be one of them, right? Right. Yeah. So so Beth, I think you may have had a further thought about process that I want to make sure that you get a yeah, chance. Yeah, I, I just about. wanted to clarify what I said earlier when I was talking about more about um, the, it actually goes to the who decides and uh, some of the, the issues that were better articulated after me. When I talk about sort of process and standards, it's not to imply that, that these processes should be extremely lengthy um, and protracted so much as uh, that that some of the process questions uh, are necessary 
uh, to figure out some of these, as opposed to just looking at only the substance and grafting the substance that the, you know, sort of the jurisdictional questions and whatnot. Um, but it's not to imply that we should be taking forever to do these things, because often when you hear process, it, it implies it's going to take forever. And the science is moving way too fast for that. Um, so uh, I just wanted to clarify that one, that one thing. So, so hearing, hearing your reference to the science moving too fast, uh, uh, conjures for me a question that I had that I wanted in, involving informed consent that I wanted to go back to 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 ask the three of you about. So, uh, oftentimes in informed consent, there's this sentence that uh, whereby the subject, the research subject, uh, consents to the sponsor of the study being able to uh, use the materials that are being donated by by the donor subject. Uh, mm -hmm. that those materials can be used for further research and development. Uh, that term of art, research and development, is it broad enough to contemplate uh, the kind of derivation of iPSC cells that then become organoids that go into space? Is our informed consent language good enough right now with respect to just referring to further research and development and products that may come from it? Uh, or do we need to say something in the informed consent that that that's bioaeronautical uh, that we should be mindful of? Yeah, I would add it. I would add it just because of the list of things that might might be done with the cells. We didn't know that that would be one of the things we could do with the cells when we yeah. made them. Uh, but but you know we didn't know when we first started uh, growing um, embryonic stem cells or making embryonic stem cells that we would be able to do a whole genome sequence on them. So, you know, those are things that were probably not mentioned in a lot of the earlier ones. So I think, uh, I think informed consents, for me at least, require a certain leap to the future and, and imagine what might, they might be used for. Um, and it should, be an, it should be as encompassing as it can be. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're gonna call that the leap to the future clause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that Beth, what do you think? Should there be a leap to the future clause in informed consent? To the extent that it's to the extent that it's foreseeable, um, I, I don't. I'm not sure. I would talk about like mandating it, but but uh, suggestible. I mean, yes, just the way Jean said um, that. It, it, the, the more we can disclose about even it, something that's foreseeable, even if it's not highly highly probable, the better the consent. The, the true consent is. Uh, if anything, we're usually not disclosing upfront the likelihood of or, and the foreseeability of de-identifying cells when we know we're probably going to do that in the very near future to use them for research purposes. Um, so I don't really see the downside in, in putting in something that is somewhat foreseeable and possible. So, so with that said, Graham, you had you had mentioned. I think you were the person during this conversation that introduced IRB uh, for the first time. So I want to go back to you, and I want to go two questions. One is directly on point here, and the other is, relates to something that you had said earlier that I want to, to revisit. So first, from your standpoint of looking for IRB approvals and knowing what the underlying process may have been for for the IRB to review the informed consent form. Uh, is this concept of a leap to the future clause important for you as, as an editor uh, with an understanding of what the process is? So that's one question. And then the other question I, I had goes back to something that you had said about, uh, you know, we don't have the luxury of being able to do an experiment 10 times in 90 days. As Jean said, you have to do it once every uh, 18 months or so. So my question there is, should papers that are coming from studies like that just be left on bioarchive or meta archive until they're ready with all of the data? Or is that too draconian? Do, do journal editors look at the IRB's consent no, forms? No, I, that, yeah, Beth, I wasn't suggesting this. Oh, like, I was like, wow. I was like, Graham, you got your hands full and a half as if no. you didn't already. <laughs> Go ahead, Graham. So, so first, let me confirm for Beth that, yeah, I do have my hands full. And um, the, we do 
on rare occasions get into such complicated situations where I do have to communicate with IRBs. And it is, I don't think it's generally well understood how, how unhelpful <laughs> individual institutions can be in that situation. We still unfortunately have um, this sort of um, mentality that an institution thinks it's going to protect its reputation better by not being completely mm -hmm. candid with the journal editor in defense of whatever it is, information the journal editor is trying to extract about <laughs> what's done in a piece of science. It's, it, it's, I, I, I've given enough talks on this, probably with you guys as well. As that. I'm saying, I'm That's important. The other thing that I think is worth uh, sort of bouncing back to a little bit, um, when when we were first all of us just amazed that you know four factors could turn a fibroblast into becoming an induced pluripotent stem cell we we all suddenly started fidgeting in our seats as we thought well what what's now going to be possible that we didn't think would be possible mm -hmm. and suddenly you're you're cloning dogs snuppy was real People forget about Snuppy. Snuppy was real. That was a dog that was cloned. And we now, since those, those uh, shall we say, ethically very interesting days, yeah. um, understand that that sort of thing is, is an absolute possibility. But even then, when we thought about, okay, I can make an induced pluripotent stem cell, and people started to suggest ways that they might be able to derive a gamete or something a pro gamete or have whatever phrase they tried to mm -hmm. use to say that yes we have actually achieved something give me the nobel prize now um we, we realized we really hadn't we hadn't got that far along and there was something i think ethically a little reassuring that we weren't suddenly going to be able to take an induced pluripotent stem cell not an induced totipotent stem cell and induced pluripotent stem cell and we weren't going to use that to build an egg and a sperm and boom it just hasn't happened mm -hmm. as joe public and definitely the lawyers here scientists this is going to happen mm -hmm. then of course you have to start putting language in these forms that say yes i'm happy for you to do research with my sample i'm not happy for you to turn this into a sperm and I'm definitely not happy for you to turn it into an egg. When uh, my good friend Elizabeth Blaver sent amphibians into space, the newts, as the rocket was taking off and they became low gravity, hugged. Ooh. Newts do not hug on earth. They never hug, but they basically got together as a as a as a little pod if you like and had a group hug and i think <laughs> obviously there's a level of whimsy to that situation that i think is mm -hmm. charming but it also provokes the question will we behave differently when we're in space what mm -hmm. will what will humanity do when it gets into space mm -hmm. i really want to see what a rhinoceros is going to do when it gets into space. <laughs> huh. You know, so, so Graham, at least with respect to what humans will do in space, uh, I think that's, uh, I think one of the things that Steven Spielberg tried to tell us is that until our genome yeah. changes, until our genome mm -hmm. changes, those same, those same drives that drove us 10,000 years ago and are still driving us today, Go, it's not going to matter whether you're in, and your newt story may alter my thinking here, but up until hearing <laughs> that newt story, uh, my thought is that we'll behave the same way on, on the surface of Mars or some exoplanet uh, 10 light years away. Uh, we'll behave the same way up there as down here, as long as our genome is the same. Our genome may change because there's, a, there's the bottleneck effect, right? I mean, unless we can have enough enough diversity in the gametes we send up there, um, then we're going to have a bottleneck. We're going to have a, okay. a small number of reproduced individuals, and that will definitely lead to 
changes that might lead to speciation. Okay. And I, um, I think the number, I think the, the population that you send up is going to be small enough so that that won't be a factor. I think everyone will be, um, since you can make IPF cells, you already know that whether the person has any genetic disease and you could also determine whether, well, maybe you can figure out if they have any uh, sociopathies as well. The, the comments like going back to when we were talking about gametes versus embryos going up, the standards that we have for um, estimating, shall we say, our, our, our tolerance for what constitutes personhood that we have on Earth will apply just as much to what we're yes. doing in space. Yeah. And, and similarly, I... similarly, <laughs> the paucity <laughs> of diverse representation in embryonic stem cell research mm -hmm. is still appalling. I mean, it's yeah. still mm -hmm. so appalling. And if we mm -hmm. think for one minute that the that the populations that get sent into space are going to uh, correct those continued no. failures, no. No. we're crazy. Yep. Beth, go ahead. Clarify one thing I said earlier: what the difference between, or where there was a difference between the sort of the, the the ethics of sending up embryos and gametes. Just want to clarify again: that was on the premise that what we might be doing with gametes was putting them together in space so that that it wasn't, you know, a, potentially that much of a difference. Obviously, the sending up an embryo could be very, very different ethically. Point that Graham raised, actually, I was already thinking about it when Jean said something about the diversity. I mean, we it, that, I, I mean, that's for an entire panel onto itself, but the lack of diversity in our biobanks, in our, in our, uh, it, any of the fertility uh, stock age for use or otherwise is uh, is is pretty appalling, um, and it, it's certainly something that would have you know ideally it needs to be remedied, whether it's because of this or because of other things. Yep. Um, yep. It, it's certainly highly highly problematic. It would be so, easier so though to collect diverse IPS cells than diverse oocytes. Regrettably, we need to draw this session to a close. Before doing so, it is worth underscoring three points made by my colleagues. First, as Graham explained, being able to use bioaeronautics to rescue Homo sapiens, perhaps other species as well, from another Earth meteor collision similar in magnitude to the one that ended the rule of the dinosaurs, or a nuclear winter brought on by some irreconcilable confrontation of nations against other nations will pose its own life-ending challenges. We must reduce the risks posed by these challenges to acceptable levels through science and engineering and constitutionally sound policymaking by elected officials and the administrators and regulators they appoint. Second, as Jean explained, there's a whole lot of biology both here on planet Earth and up in the International Space Station that we must master before we can even go to nearby Mars. One of the points of intersection of Jean's work with rescuing the northern white rhinoceros from extinction and her study of neural organoids on the space station is, no pun intended, space to trek to a set of coordinates in space-time relative to which we here today will be far away and long ago by the time that trek ends will require an economy of space and functional support. Stem cell science by definition at its cellular scale may offer a solution to this need for economy. But there's a whole lot of science and engineering that needs to be pioneered for us to avail of that solution. Beyond all that science and technology stuff, Beth helped us understand that it's not just physics, chemistry, and biology that we need to figure out, but also a set of enduring bioethical principles, some of which will interleaf with those that have already arisen here on Earth, 
and some of which will need to be newly drawn to account for the challenges in the space-time of tomorrow that are simply not encountered here on Earth today. Examples of the former, those that are here on Earth today, include the possibility that we need to update our standard informed consent forms for donations of somatic cells to make it clear that some of those somatic cells may be transformed into organoids and other cells that end up on the space, International Space Station for the purpose of researching the impact of microgravity on human biology. Another pressing ethical challenge here on Earth today is diversity. This problem is encountered in many fields, including bioaeronautics and artificial intelligence. Two topics that intersect with stem cell-based regenerative medicine and are covered by several panels at this year's World Stem Cell Summit. Like quality by design, QBD as it's known, that the healthcare industry exploits to achieve ever increasing levels of safety and effectiveness of its goods and services, we need diversity by design, DBD as it could be called. DBD may help us achieve ever increasing levels of diversity in every aspect of the technologies on which our society depends, including without limitation, artificial intelligence, stem cell science, medicine, both classical and regenerative, bioaeronautics, and the permutations and combinations to which those four give rise. The backdrop that all three of my colleagues have just painted for us is called time. Having the capacity to maintain humanity by migrating to distant objects in space-time will take much longer than the near decade that it took to get from a presidential declaration in 1962 to a first step for humankind on the surface of Earth's moon and the 24 years that have elapsed since the first component of the International Space Station was carried into orbit around Earth. Very simply stated, if we want to have any hope of blasting into space to maintain humanity sometime decades, hopefully not centuries from now, we need to tackle all of these scientific engineering and social diversity by design challenges in order to increase the probability of success of that important mission. So in closing, on behalf of my colleagues and the World Stem Cell Summit 2022, thank you for participating in this year's summit. Without fail, each year since 2005, its inaugural year, the World Stem Cell Summit has presented us with thought-provoking pathways to infinity and beyond.